What's up everybody, it's ProbDP here with Channel Ace Pants. Today we're going to talk about right ventricular myocardial infarction in 12 minutes. So without further ado, let's get started. Let's go over the coronary blood supply. Coronary blood supply is split into right coronary artery and left coronary artery. Both of them come off the aorta and supply blood to the heart. Left coronary artery is divided into left anterior descending artery and circumflex. Right coronary artery is divided into right marginal arteries and posterior descending artery. The marginal uh, supply the right ventricle and the posterior descending artery supplies blood to the posterior aspect of the left ventricle. Now another thing to keep in mind here is that the right ventricle also gets a collateral from the left anterior descending artery. So the main supplier is the right marginal arteries and then they also have some collateral from the left uh, anterior descending artery. Right ventricle myocardial infarction is a rare event. It's associated with about 30 to 50 percent of inferior wall MIs. And inferior wall MI accounts for 40 percent of all myocardial infarctions. Now you guys might be wondering as to why we're going over all this if it occurs rarely, right? Well, the reason for that is that right ventricular MIs are associated with high in-hospital morbidity and mortality due to its profound hemodynamic and electrical complications. But the long-term prognosis is generally good as long as the patient survives the acute event. So our main goal as clinicians is to recognize this pathology in a timely manner and get the patient through the acute phase. Now let me explain as to why acutely right ventricular MI can be devastating, but long term the prognosis is very good. The name right ventricular myocardial infarction is a little misleading. The reason for that is that right ventricular MI will have ischemia, but rarely ever will it progress to infarction. Okay, and there are three reasons why this doesn't happen. So the reason number one is oxygen demand is significantly lower as compared to the left ventricle because the workload is lower for the, uh, for the right side. So the oxygen demand is going to be lower. And the reason number two is that the coronary perfusion occurs in both during systole and diastole for the right side of the heart. So the right ventricle is getting perfused throughout the cardiac cycle. So even if there's an occlusion, it's still going to get more blood supply as compared to the left ventricle because left ventricle only gets perfused during diastole. And the number three reason is uh, the right ventricle has extensive collaterals. As we have spoken before, the right ventricle gets perfused from the right coronary arteries through the right marginal arteries. And also, it can get perfusion from the left coronary arteries through the left anterior descending artery. So it's getting perfusion from both of the main arteries. So if one goes out, it can, it can still rely on the second one to provide some perfusion. Now because of all these factors, the right ventricle has a lot more time before the ischemia can evolve into infarction. And that's why these patients have a good long-term prognosis because at the end of the day, the prognosis is solely dependent on how much of the heart muscle was infarcted. And because in right ventricular MI, the chances of ischemia developing into infarction are low, the prognosis is generally good. Now let's discuss why right ventricular myocardial infarction is so devastating acutely. So the ischemia of the right ventricle causes it to lose the contractility and it becomes very stiff. Because of that, it doesn't effectively dilate or contract. So this in return causes decrease in the preload and the afterload. So by definition, preload is the pressure in the ventricle at the end of diastole. So at the point where the ventricle is completely dilated, filled with blood, that pressure that's felt by the myocytes at the end of diastole, that's referred to as preload. Afterload, on the other hand, is the pressure in the myocytes that it needs to contract to get the blood out into the periphery. So on the left ventricle, is the pressure that it needs to overcome the pressure of the aorta. And on the right side, it's going to be the pressure of the pulmonary uh, vasculature. Okay. Now, don't get this confused. Preload and afterload does not equate to the volume that the heart contains or is putting out. No. It's the pressure in the ventricles. Okay. Preload is the pressure right before systole and end of diastole. And afterload is the pressure in the systole that the ventricle needs to create to get the blood out into the periphery. Okay, now since we know the definition of preload and afterload and how they're affected in right ventricular MI, let's see its systemic effects. So now since the output of the right ventricle is decreased, there's less blood going to the lungs. That means there's less blood going to the uh, left atrium, the left ventricle, and then systemically there's less blood being put out from the left ventricle. 
Now this creates a state of hyperperfusion systemically. This will happen even if the left ventricle ejection fraction is completely intact. Now let's take a patient and say the ejection fraction is decreased and they have a right ventricular MI. If that is the case, then the systemic hyperperfusion we just talked about is going to be much worse. The reason for that is the right ventricle lies on the interventricular septum for its contraction. Now if at our baseline, the left ventricle is putting out less ejection fraction. That means the right ventricle is also being affected. And if on top of that, you develop an MI of the right ventricle, then the state of hyperperfusion is going to get even worse in the setting of low left ventricular ejection fraction and the right ventricular MI. Also, if the right atrium is involved or there is severe tricuspid regurgitation, then the preload and the afterload is affecting even more in right ventricular MI and can cause severe hypotension. Right atrial ischemia can happen if the lesion is very proximal in the RCA, the right coronary artery, then it can involve both the right atrium and the right ventricle. Now, as we learned before, when the right ventricle becomes ischemic and becomes stiff and is not able to contract well. Well, the same thing happens with the right atrium. If it becomes ischemic, it's not able to dilate properly, so it's not going to accommodate the blood volume that's coming in from the periphery, and it's not going to be able to contract well to put all the blood that it has into the right ventricle. Now, for that reason, if there's less blood going into the right ventricle, that means the preload is decreasing even further. So that's why if you have right atrial ischemia along with right ventricle ischemia, the preload and afterload are going to be severe decreased causing hypotension and in terms of tricuspid valve it's attached to the papillary muscles in the right ventricle if the papillary muscles become ischemic and they rupture then they can detach from the tricuspid causing severe tricuspid regurgitation which will decrease the cardiac output of the right ventricle because the volume that was supposed to go into the pulmonary vasculature is now going back into the right atrium now it's going to decrease the amount of blood that's going to the lungs for being oxygenated and therefore it's going to cause the state, it's going to worsen the state of hyperperfusion. Now these patients will present with the classic chest pain associated with MI. They also might have nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, dizziness, or they might have anxiety-like symptoms like numbness, tingling in their hands and lips, or hyperventilation. The chest pain is secondary to the ischemia in the cardiac muscles. Nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, and dizziness are all because of the vagal tone discharge while the anxiety symptoms are from sympathetic tone discharge. Now this might be confusing as to how you can have both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system active. Well the answer to that is that they're not both active at the same time. You either have the vagal tone symptoms or you have the sympathetic tone symptom. It all depends on what part of the heart is affected and how much of it is affected and based on that you might have different symptoms. That's why these patients will present with either bradyarrhythmias or tachyarrhythmias. Now because the right side of MI involves the SA and the AV node, these patients are at a higher risk of developing heart blocks. Not only that, even if these patients don't develop a heart block, they're still at risk for developing hypertension just from sinus bradycardia. Now I know this is getting confusing. Why are these patients developing sinus bradycardia when their whole body is being underperfused? Technically the brain should kick in and should make the heart work harder by increasing heart rate and increasing cardiac output. So why in this case are they developing sinus bradycardia? Now we understand with heart blocks, the AV node and the SA node might become ischemic and infarcted and the patient might develop a heart block. But why are these patients getting sinus bradycardia is the real question at this point. It isn't clear as to why this happened, but it is believed that it may be because of basalt gerish reflex. Now, basalt gerish reflex is an inhibitory reflex that when stimulated activates the parasympathetic nervous system and inhibits the sympathetic nervous system causing hypotension through systemic vasodilation. It is characterized by a triad of bradycardia, hypotension, and apnea. Now this happened because this reflex activates the parasympathetic nervous system which is known to slow down the heart, breathing, and causes systemic vasodilation. And that's how you get the bradycardia, apnea, and hypotension. Now as to why this phenomenon takes place when the body needs perfusion the most, it's kind of unclear. However, there is one theory that can possibly explain as to why body activates this reflex. So now we know that the preload decreases in right ventricular MI, right? So if the body slows down the heart rate, that means it will give the ventricle more time to fill up with blood, therefore increasing the preload, okay? And secondly, it causes systemic vasodilation, so the metabolic need of the ventricle can go down. And that's because if there's vasodilation, it was very easy for the ventricle to pump blood into the systemic vasculature. All right. 
If the vessels were very constrictive, it's going to take double the effort to get the blood out. So for that reason, vasodilation is kind of helping the heart by decreasing the workload, therefore decreasing the metabolic rate. And if the metabolic rate is decreased, then it's going to need less nutrition and less oxygen. So in a way, it's kind of trying to help the heart, try to preserve it from becoming infarcted or you know try to lessen the ischemia in a way. That's the only explanation as to why this phenomena is somewhat helpful for the body. Now in terms of clinical exam, you're gonna notice that lungs are going to be clear on auscultation. The JVD is going to be elevated in the setting of hypertension. When you see these findings, this should make you suspicious of right ventricular myocardial infarction. And the reason why the lungs are clear in this setting is because we're having right-sided heart failure. So it skips the lung, okay? Whereas left-sided heart failure is going to involve the lung causing pulmonary congestion and you won't have clear lungs on your exam. Now, if you suspect MI, then you should perform an EKG immediately. If you notice any ST or T wave changes and leads to 3 and AVF, then right sided leads should be performed to rule out right ventricular involvement. But if you see ST depressions and lateral leads along with inferior wall MI, then that is suggestive of right ventricular MI. Also, if the ST elevation is greater in lead 3 than lead 2 and the ST elevation in AVF is greater than the ST depression in lead V2, then that's also suggestive of right ventricular MI. Just keep in mind that both V1 and V2 provide a partial view of the right ventricular free wall. That's why we can use the ST depression lead to and compare it to ST elevation AVF and try to come up with a diagnosis of right ventricular MI. However, the most accurate finding is ST elevation of more than one millimeters in the right V4 lead. It has 100% sensitivity, 87% specificity, and 92% predictive accuracy. Once you have developed the diagnosis of right ventricular MI, then avoid giving diuretics, beta blockers, morphine, and nitrates. These interventions will further decrease the preload and resulting in hypotension or worsening already existing hypotension. The mainstay of treatment should be increasing the preload and cardiac output. Now this can be done through resuscitation with IV fluids and pressors if needed, followed by the PCI. These patients have a good long-term prognosis so we need to get through the acute phase effectively without any delays to give the patient the best outcome possible. Alright guys, that marks the end of the video. If you guys got any value out of this, then please show support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the bell button for future videos. And please stay safe, stay tuned, and I'll be back next week.